I'd like to introduce, uh, proudly happy to introduce our speaker today, Lori Lippin Brown, who served as the first director of the Secular Coalition of America from 2005 through 2009. A former lawyer and educator, Brown served in the Nevada State Senate, Senate from 1992 through 1994. Outside of the secularist and non-theistic movement, Brown worked in education and law. From 1996 to 2000, she was the National Education Association's diversity trainer. Formerly a private lawyer, she taught the United States constitutional law, education law, and American history through the University of Phoenix. Her work on LGBTQ issues is included in the Dennis McBride's 2016, uh, 2016 text, Out of the Neon Closet, Queer Community in the Silver State. So you can read about her work in that book. Brown authored a chapter, um, authored a chapter of 50 Voices of Disbelief, Why We Are Atheists, by, edited by Russell Blackford in 2009, and is quoted extensively in American Secularism, Cultural Contours of non uh, Contours of Non-Religious Belief Systems by Joseph Q. Baker in 2015. Awards include the Free Thought Backbone Award from the Secular Student Alliance. I love that Backbone Award. The Civil Libertarian of the Year from the Southern Nevada Chapter of the ACLU, Legislator of the Year from the Nevada Chapter of the National Association of Social Workers, and Friend of Center Award, Friend of the Center Award from the Gay and Lesbian Community Center of Southern Nevada, and the Mark DeWolf Award from Interweave Continental. Brown earned a BA from University of Nevada in Las Vegas in 1981 and a Doctor of Jurisprudence from Southwestern University Law School in 1983. And she's come here to talk to us, uh, kind of wrap up our speaker series. And it's so great that she took the time to come here. So Lori Littman Brown. Thank you. Thank you so very much for including me in this wonderful series. And a special thanks to the organizers of these platforms for working around my schedule so I could participate. I'd like you to think back to about a month ago. How many of you uh, were at the first platform talk of this series by Zoom or in person by a show of hands? Great. I don't know if, yeah, okay. Um, I'm looking over at the Zoom. And by the way, hello from also from my friend in Las Vegas who joined us. <laughs> Uh, well, back that week, Brian Silva from Americans United gave a wonderful definition of freedom of religion. He said, in essence, that freedom of religion means believe as you choose and so practice as long as it doesn't harm others. The so long as it doesn't harm others part focuses the spotlight on the metaphorical shark in the title of this talk. And by the way, the intro with the information about that Oscar award nominated movie um, really fits well uh, the way you talked about it in terms of believe, practice, but don't do harm to others or force others to believe. The court cases that put individuals free exercise of religion above the harm done regarding discrimination and other attacks, especially in the LGBTQ plus cases that Silva highlighted, show a lack of respect for the free exercise of those who don't share plaintiff's religious beliefs and create the imprimatur of government endorsement of certain religions over others and those without religious beliefs in clear violation of the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. I have noticed a number of the plaintiffs in more recent church state legal cases have veered away from the free exercise of religion argument. Perhaps understanding the pitfalls of its establishment clause tension, if government is involved, and the conundrum posed by the needs uh, for others to also enjoy the free exercise of their own beliefs or non-belief. Instead, the free speech clause of the First Amendment has been invoked lately in cases calling for the right to discriminate against LGBTQ plus people when offering services to the public, such as baking a wedding cake. And to avoid the appearance of imposition of religion, the attempt currently underway in a Texas court to take away FDA approval of the abortion drug mifeprestone is being presented not as a religious 
challenge, but as a challenge to the process that was originally used to make that approval. Although the drug has now been approved and used safely for over 20, relatively safely for over 20 years, that original approval process is the smokescreen for an obvious anti-abortion religious move based on plaintiff's own religion. Being the last speaker of this series, I suspected you would have heard much about historic and recent laws and cases at this juncture. And if you missed those, I recommend streaming them if they have them available here. <laughs> and I was correct. The highly esteemed lineup to date has done a fantastic job. So I do want to focus on the very latest updates in the legislative, regu regulatory, and court realm, and of course, what actions you can take to help protect our secular democracy from theocratic threats. But first, I want to discuss the word secular. Today, I come to you as a board member of the Secular Coalition for America, which, as mentioned, I served on as its director from 2005 to 2009 as its first paid staff. I had the pleasure of welcoming the American Ethical Union as one of the early members of the coalition back in 2008. It has always been important to me that everyone, not just our constituency, can and should support secular government. I'm going to borrow a useful freedom, uh, a useful exercise that we watched the Freedom Forum speakers, Hannah Santos and Benjamin Marcus, use a couple of weeks ago. So I won't say I stole it from them, but it was such a great idea that I'm going to use it for this exercise. I'm going to ask you to think about the meaning of three phrases, and we're going to do a very short brainstorm, maybe take three answers for each one um, to keep within the 20 minutes. And so the first phrase that I want you to think about is the phrase secular person. What do you think of when you think of a secular person? And if you can uh, have an answer to that, raise your hand. Jim. I think a secular person is a person no matter what his or her religious background might be. You might, Jim. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have done that without uh, warning. <laughs> sorry. Well. I think a secular person, I think of myself as a secular person, I think what, that what makes me a secular person is that I come from a nominally religious background, although I was brought up as a secular person, and I think a secular person is someone who come, may or may not come from a religious background, but honors its traditions without necessarily um, ad adhering to the belief in a deity. And I, I'm hearing the not necessarily requiring belief in a deity uh, part, especially, and that makes perfect sense for the individual. Yep, secular person. Anyone else have um, anything to add to that? Because that was that was pretty good. Yes. No pageantry. No pageantry. So I'm hearing kind of an opposite. Keep the ritual or the, or the traditions, but no pageantry. <laughs> So, you know, there's there's a wide variety of secular uh, persons and how they consider how they live. Uh, and one more, uh, if we can. I think of a secular person as somebody who is basically neither motivated by nor caring very much about what I will call broadly religious faith, faith in something transcendent supernatural it's a yada 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 so whose whose life is focused on and oriented the to the the world as we see perceive live in it etc um and not and is and specifically i mean because a, a person of faith can be also but is specifically not focused on or or really oriented to questions of faith and and uh, that brings up a good point one of the reasons i don't like um debates about whether does does God exist is because I like the term apatheist. Like, does it matter? <laughs> you know, regardless, there's a certain way you should behave. So well said. Um, now I'd like you to think about the term of uh, the phrase secular form of government. Thanks. And if I can just jump in here, we may have some suggestions from Zoom land. Uh, so folks, if you want to know how to raise your hand in Zoom, uh, I think most of you all already know how to do it in Zoom, um, but uh, I do see that uh, Gwen Levine has her hand up. 
So uh, if you're all right, I'll take uh, ask Gwen to unmute herself and we can have her share. Go ahead, Ed. Go ahead, Gwen. Hey, I think I did it. Uh, immediately, secular government comes to mind as, as uh, a big wall between religion and government. I do not think a Supreme Court where two thirds of the people are Catholics should be making a decision on uh, Roe v. Wade based on more religion, even if they're claiming legal reasons. They're clever enough to do both, but obviously I think biased. So, so that's not secular. The opposite would be secular. That's it. I, I love love that definition. Uh, do we have uh, one, uh, another? Hi. Yes. Secular state is a government or state which uh, accepts and respects all religions and and treat them in unequal basis. And, and I, I think sometimes that's uh, that important um, part of it is missed amongst certain religious people who believe it's the opposite of being religious, whereas a secular government is about the government treating everybody uh, equally. And Jim? I look to the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. Everybody knows the famous words, unalienable rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, but the next set sentence refers to what is the purpose of government. And it says to secure these rights, governments are instituted. And I think that to me defines the purpose of government, the primary purpose, which is pr to protect those individual rights. And that really highlights what I like to bring up about the constitution ensuring that we have a secular government. There was a historical fight about whether to include religion and God in, in the constitution and those who wanted to lost that fight. And instead we have a secular constitution that um, tells us that things like life, liberty and the pursuit of, well, those aren't in it. But, but yes, very, very clear distinction. Yep. Um, I might also add the opposite of a theocracy where the, go the government uh, laws are based in religion. And just to further confuse matters, we'll just take two answers on this one. Consider the secularist. Secularist. Um, we'll just take two if, if anybody has a thought on what that might be. We may have already covered it, actually. By the way, hi to Ken, who we got one more was here. a wonderful uh, host when I visited before. Secularist suggests to me someone who's actively articulating and standing up for and waving the flag for this particular point of view, since most Americans have some vague religiously affiliated, you know, aura around them. So it takes some energy to put out this point of view, even though it's yes. quite widespread. <laughs> I think. That's perfect, unless we had someone else waiting. We yes, have Karen. Karen. Oh. Karen? Hi. Um, I agree. It is somebody that realizes how important um, the um, separation of church and state is and how much it affects our policies in this country. And um, I just want to mention that the United States actually signed the UN Declaration for um, the Rights of Children in 95, but we have um, never ratified it into law. And um, that is protecting a lot of what goes on and the attack on immigrants and the trafficking. And I just thought I would mention that because um, it should have been ratified into law if people weren't profiting from it. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Karen. And, and Karen, I wanna, um, because you mentioned that, I wanna also mention that Later in the talk, I'm going to be talking about the Do No Harm Act. Part of that act says you can't use religion to deny um, or to allow uh, a certain mistreatment of children. So 
And I don't specifically say that in the talk, but that's in there too. Uh, thank you. So re religious people, as was mentioned, theistic people, people who have a belief. I know not every religious person is theistic, but also re theistic people can and do support secular government. Some of our strongest allies in the fight to protect the secular form of government promised in our constitution are practicing believing Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, and other non -sec people who might identify as non-secular. You will find some of our strongest allies in groups like the Interfaith Alliance and the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty. In week two of this series, Dan Barker told you about religion, a Freedom from Religion Foundation's co-production along with the Baptist Joint Committee of a report on the January 6th insurrection and the influence of Christian nationalism on that uprising. The name of the BJC's group, Christians Against Christian Nationalism, makes clear that the personal religious beliefs and practices do not preclude supporting a secular government. The AEU has been a member of the Secular Coalition for America since its early days in 2008. Therefore, you are represented by our full-time lobbyist, Scott McConomy. I called him last week for a heads up on the most recent and or most pressing legislative actions that the SCA is working on among others. He mentioned the SKIRT Act or sec the uh, Supreme Court Ethics Recusal and Transparency Act. It's sponsored on the House side by Representative Hank Johnson of Georgia and concurrently in the Senate by Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island. Currently, the Supreme Court does not have their own code of ethics and they have no official recusal process. The Skirt Act would put those in place as well as requirements for reporting certain gifts and travel, as well as dark money and lobbying interests regarding matters before the courts and also regarding helping uh, with the um, getting confirmed and disclosing relationships with groups that file amicus briefs or friend of the court briefs. The SCA encourages you to ask your representative and senators to support this important bill, the Skirt Act. I know someone in the Q&A a few weeks back had asked about what can be done about the Supreme Court. And while it's a very sticky subject with pros and cons on various ways to do things, at least this bill will be a start and some help to at least knowing what's underneath it all. Turning our attention to money, the SCA monitors and works on a large number of spending bills so I asked Scott for a couple of examples. Two examples are in the spending bill regarding funding for the IRS, trying to get the IRS to enforce the Johnson Amendment, which disallows churches from endorsing candidates. And in another spending bill to get the Justice Department and Department of Homeland Security to monitor white religious nationalists. We usually call say white Christian nationalists given who seems to be behind all this at this point, but generally any white religious nationalists. The SCA is in communication with Senator Pryor who heads the National Prayer Breakfast Foundation to suggest including a humanist military chaplain in next year's roster. We try to do small steps in these you know, breakfasts. Uh, Scott tells me that even though it still exists, this year's prayer breakfast was a huge improvement over what they used to be uh, now that they're run by a different group and a lot less of the tent revival stuff and super lobbying of people with big money. The SCA was on its own fighting against the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and the extension of that to land use law, laws and prisons, RELUPA, back in the 2000s. But now that the negative effects we foresaw of these laws on church state separation are being seen in numerous instances, Others have come on board to try to fend off these dangerous privileging of religion laws. Currently, the Biden administration is being sued by some federal employees over COVID mandates, citing RIFRA. Cases using RIFRA are also pending in West Virginia and Missouri. RIFRA and RELUPA, privileging religion over non-religious laws, such as anti-discrimination, zoning regulations, and health and safety requirements for religious schools. We are seeing a positive use, however, of RIFRA. An Indiana lawsuit challenged that state's abortion ban on religious freedom grounds. 
Massachusetts. Although the case is currently being appealed, the lower court enjoined the ban from going into effect based on the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So it goes both ways and we're learning how to use it while it's in place. Speaking of RIFRA, the SCA continues to push for passage of the Do No Harm Bill. And I know some of you are familiar with that already because that was also mentioned in a previous week. It will likely be reintroduced by Representative Bobby Scott of Virginia in the House, but it may also be reintroduced on the Senate side by Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey. Exactly. <laughs> This bill explicitly prohibits the use of RIFRA to override certain discrimination and labor laws or to curtail the provision of access to information about referrals for or coverage for any healthcare item or service. It didn't get to a vote in either chamber following the earlier introduction in both houses. This bill, but they're reintroducing it in uh, this session. This bill is also a high priority for the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. You may recall Dan Barker mentioning that group of very active members working on issues close to our heart. In fact, the SCA loves it when constituents invite their own representatives to join this caucus. There are currently no representatives from New Jersey on there. The coalition also includes at least four groups that have legal staff, the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the American Humanist Association, American Atheists, and Center for Inquiry. After touching base with them for some ongoing Supreme Court cases, I want to highlight two in which some of our member organizations are involved, at least in terms of filing amicus briefs. The first is 303 Creative versus Elenis. This is one of the cases Brian Silva mentioned. It regards a website designer in Colorado who wants to post notice on her website that she won't make websites for gay weddings. She is highlighting free speech but as a certain kind of Christian, she is also taking her lead from the Masterpiece Cake Shop case that allowed a baker to refuse to make cakes for gay weddings based on free speech. Next is Groff v. DeJoy. A Christian postal employee refuses to work on Sundays and wants the Supreme Court to uphold his right to do this as an accommodation for his religion. At first glance, I thought, well, why not just have another postal car carrier cover Sundays and make the accommodation? But here's what I found out. This person took employment on an as-needed basis, then chose to move to a small four-person postal office, rural, where he, his not working Sundays would create an undue hardship for the post office, which had accepted a contract with Amazon to deliver pay packages. Now for what I expect is every AEU member's favorite part of these talks, what can you do? What deeds are needed? The Department of Education needs to hear from me as many of us as possible regarding regulations put in place during the prior administration that mandates colleges and universities fund religious groups, even if that group does not comply with the college's anti-discrimination policies. Only religious groups are given this leeway to discriminate and exclude. There is currently a comment period that ends on March 24th of this year. So I'll ask the tech, fo tech folks to please show the link and text from American Atheists to take action. Please go to the link before the deadline. And if it can't be shown, I'm sure we could get it to whoever wants it at some point. Oh, there it is. It's in the chat and uh, there's the link. Um, and if you can't find it that easily, just go to American Atheists and, and search for it, or go to Secular Student Alliance, another member of the Secular Coalition for America. And today, I believe it was today or yesterday, they just did an alert on this. So both are working this. Um, American Atheists follows hundreds of state cases, as well as regulations on issues such as denial of care and faith-based social services using government funding. You can sign up for their alerts at atheist.org. The Secular Coalition for America is having its next lobby day in just 12 days in Washington, DC. If you can participate in this, please visit SCA's website, secular.org, and sign up this week because they do need to cut off the registration in time to make the asks for visits with your representatives' offices. So the sooner the better. And this year they're doing it in person. 
While you are on SCA's website, please sign up if you haven't already to get our updates and action alerts, including Scott McConaughey's Heretic on the Hill reports. They're pretty good. You already have a stake in the Ethical Society, but I encourage you to check out the other 20 members of the Secular Coalition for America. You may enjoy getting updates and perhaps supporting some of those as well. There are links to each of them on the SCA website, secular.org. By the way, the SCA has a new hire later this month who will be specializing in communication. So I expect you'll find better stuff and more updates on that website in the near future. Now, I expect you already know the rest of the answers to what can you do, vote, support the professional organizations that work for your causes, with checkbook, volunteering, actions, or better yet, all, all of those if you can. And there is one more action I recommend considering, well, two more. Uh, support candidates and volunteers on their, and volunteer on their campaigns, and think about running for office yourself. The, uh, even local, small local offices have a huge impact on the community. The takeovers of local school boards, by anti-LGBTQ plus folks, conspiracy theorists, self-assigned censors against inclusivity has shown all of us that the races to watch are not just for the White House and Congress. And if you, even if you lose, you can amplify the message of ethical living that groups like yours embody. And if you win, you can think about becoming a member of the coalition of secular elected officials that Dan Barker mentioned. And I, made myself a member because of my prior service in the Nevada legislature. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart, not just for having me come and speak today, but for letting me go five minutes over and for all that you do, <laughs> because ethical culture folks are truly heroes in the way they live by the actions that help make this a better world. Thank you. So this was just the first part of our presentation. We're now going to as part of our uh, process of dialogue, you probably have questions, things that she said, or you want uh, to offer your own insights, but let's realize that there's about 70, uh, 80 of us around. So we're gonna have to keep this very short. And let's start maybe with some questions. Did anybody have any questions for Jerry? I'm concerned about the meaning of I'm concerned that we might be throwing out the baby with bathwater. Most of the major religions have strong humanistic bent to them. We've taken a, a right wing folks who are hiding behind their religion, um, but in, in reality, they, they are not really religious at all. What happens when we have to face the, 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 the reality that most that the, the, the positive parts about most religions is their, their humanism. And we might be confusing that or the right wing hiding uh, within, the, uh, within the, the faith communities. And uh, I love that question because it goes to the heart of why um, both the Secular Coalition for America and me individually, uh, work so well with interfaith groups. Uh, we don't do this alone. Uh, and by we, you don't do it alone. Ethical culture doesn't do it alone. Uh, Secular Coalition for America doesn't do it alone. Some of my favorite memories are walking the halls of Congress and meeting with members and their staff um, in a group with the Baptist Joint Committee, the Jewish uh, group, I can't remember the name of, the, uh, Bap uh, the Interfaith Alliance, uh, and a bunch of religious, and when it was uh, on vouchers for private religious education, um, the National Education Association, we were not there alone. What we did was unheard of, though. Each of us would tell, I mean, unheard of in terms of having someone who was not theistic in the mix, tell those staffers, how is this going to affect that constituency, that constituency, Jewish students, atheist students? Just matter of fact, that hadn't happened before where that was made explicit that it doesn't matter your beliefs. 
these are the deeds that need to get done. And uh, there's power in that and power in recognizing that we have so much in common with the humanistic parts of and, and religions that are completely humanistic. And Eric, can you remind people how to uh, raise their hand online? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Well, most of you will already know how to raise your hand in Zoom in order to indicate that you wish to speak. But if you're not sure how to do it or you can't find it, click on the reactions button at the bottom of your screen. If you're on a tablet or a telephone, click the three dots at the bottom right of your screen and you should see it as an option. We especially ask that you not rely on physically waving your hand in the Zoom screen for the simple reason that we probably won't see it. So for those of you who are dialed in on the phone, remember that to raise your hand, you press star nine. To mute or unmute your phone, you press star six. Star nine to raise your hand, star six to mute or unmute your phone. Thank you. And we have Karen Grissom with her hand raised. I uh, posted a couple of things in the chat. One is an interview with Marcy Hamilton, um, Child USA, um, about some of the dangers um, that have happened with the extreme in the name of extreme religion, religious liberty, which I don't think it really is. And, and also another article um, where fundraising is done in, in the name of Christianity um, that um, funds actually Proud Boys and um, Kyle Rittenhouse and other things. And it's really about misusing um, the tax exemption. Um, Thank you, Karen. Do you have a question for our speaker or would you like our speaker to reflect on those? Um, no, I just wanted to let people know that they were there, but boy, thank you. They've just been doing awful stuff. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for uh, posting those uh, in the chat. Uh, again, I, I love that ethical culture is all about taking action. And Terry online? Uh, no, sorry, Ken. Yes. Hi, Lori. Uh, so Hi, glad Ken. that you came to visit us again. Great to see you. Uh, to the best of your knowledge, have any members of the Free Thinkers Caucus or any of those members practicing traditional religions and yet still chose to join the caucus? I believe so. Um, I don't want to speak out of turn. So I think. Uh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure uh, we have some religious folks who just support secular government, absolutely. And uh, in fact, I remember uh, years ago, we thought, oh, maybe this one member of Congress out in California, maybe she'll come out as a non-theist with us. And we found out she was actually um, a very religious uh, Christian humanist woman, um, theistic who uh, just was such a great supporter of church and state that we all assumed she was one of, of, of us, our ident identifiers. But uh, yes, there are, there are some. Um, I know that the, um, I don't know what his religious beliefs are or aren't, but the co-chairs, uh, well, the co one of the co-chairs is Jared Huffman. And his, he's really focused a lot on the environment and science um, as his specialty. Uh, one of the other co-chairs is uh, Jamie, Raskin, who is my Congress member, and uh, he won an award from the, I believe it was from the American Humanist Association quite a while back, maybe even from Secular Coalition. Uh, he identifies as Jewish, but I'm certain um, humanistically. And if you go to the American Web uh, United presentation we did here, they showed a video of all the clergy who are actually standing up for women's rights uh in other places and joining in with a kind of continuation of that secular culture dan so i have a question about the legislation uh that would prohibit groups funded on college campuses from discriminating 
uh, if I that was legislation, if I understood correctly. And so here's a question: Would that require, let us say, a Jewish group to accept non-Jews as members of a minyan if they were conducting worship services? Because if so, I would have a real problem with that. Not that I support personally um, Jewish law that limits, you know, minions to only men, or you know, I mean, blah blah blah, or, or you know. Uh, or for those who are not born Jewish, only to those who are converted on the earth. I mean, that's nonsense as far as I'm concerned. But for the government to say, um, no, you can't practice, you can't practice your religious service. You have to accept as quora in your religious services people whom your religion does not allow as quora in religious services. I have a real problem with that, and I would think that. Um, that's the kind of fight that has to happen within Judaism, and certainly not for the government to say, yeah, Joe fundamentalist Christian wants to come in as a Jew for Jesus and count as part of your minion. I would say the hell with that. The right. Jewish organization should be protected against that kind of thing. So yeah. what, what they're asking is that religious groups be treated on campus exactly the same way other groups are. So for example, if if the university uh, required um, a gay-straight alliance to uh, not exclude someone who's spouting anti-gay rhetoric, then that would apply to all groups, um, even though it's not a religious group that, you know, they, it just, there's different rules uh, for, for religious groups versus any other group. Whether or not that would still allow for groups to require that people who join their groups um, be um, like-minded, uh, participating, um, and and if someone you know is is participating in Jewish ritual with the group, it depends what the rules are on campus. But whatever those rules are, they should be the same for religious groups and all the other groups. Uh, if we could use that as example, Yeshiva University here in New York, of course, uh, denied uh, an LGBTQ group uh, to organize on campus. And so the city was basically saying, well, if you're taking public funding, you have to pay by the same rules, but they're, they're constituted as a conservator or is it an Orthodox university, Orthodox university? So the question is, is for you as someone who's been a legislator and, and knows these things, is what are the limits of saying we can take federal funding, but we're going to to um, change the rules a little bit? And what what are people coming down and saying? Where are we now in the government that our public money can be used for private groups and that yeah. may dis discriminate against others we think should be included? And and this this came up uh, way back under George W. Bush. Um, there was a lot of government funds being used to do social services through church groups. And because they were using government funds, they shouldn't have been allowed to discriminate when it came to something like hiring a, a social worker or somebody to deliver meals to somebody. But because uh, these were religious groups, um, the, the Bush administration was allowing them to uh, say, like the Salvation Army, the bell ringers, they wouldn't hire anyone who wasn't Christian. And that was allowed. I think it still is probably. Um, so under the, the uh, Obama administration, uh, there, were, there, were, uh, there was a lot of lobbying in part by these groups that I'm talking about. And um, there was less of that. I don't know if it got completely undone, but if you take government funds, then for, a, for something that is not a religious service, you can't proselytize and you can't discriminate in your hiring of people to do these things. Um, however, under the Trump, uh, I shouldn't be using names, under the previous administration, um, almost all of that was rolled back. And now we're fighting to roll it back in where, um, you know, if you're taking government funds, that shouldn't be used for discriminatory practices. In fact, one of the funniest or saddest or scariest comments, I believe, I believe it was 
Jeff Sessions, but I'm not positive, who answered a question in a committee. This is way back during the Bush administration. Um, the question was, um, if a Christian group gets money to house the homeless and you're hiring a janitor with that money to clean up the place that you're going to house these, these people, what difference does it make what religion they are? And the answer that we that was given was, I know that if someone is a Christian, they'll be better at mopping the floor than if they're not a Christian. So we can we can discriminate. Anyway, Perry. Yes. Hi. Right. Um, over here. Oh, oh, it may may not have been. I'm sorry. It may not have been sessions. So I may be getting the quotes mixed up. But somebody answered that way. Yes. Uh, okay. Hi. Thank you so much for being here this morning. And uh, a question concern, um, and I don't know whether you're addressing that through the organization. Um, it seems that, um, I don't know if attack is really too strong a word, but it feels that way to me on the facts. Because, you know, two plus two needs to always add up to four. Otherwise, there's you can't really have a conversation. And it seems that there's a long game going on uh, in Texas, in Florida, most lately uh, that's in the news of what's going on with, uh, are we allowed to say names like Sarah? Uh, yeah, you can. I, uh, what's going I on there, where <laughs> there's looking to control curriculum, um, both by insertion and by deletion of mm -hmm. facts. And the long game being that it's generational. And I don't know whether that's being addressed and how it's being addressed. And I was wondering if you could enlighten me as to what's going on with that. Well, the, the attempts at uh, imposing a, a white Christian nationalist mindset um, are, are being, there's a bunch of groups, including ours, including just a, a million different groups, figuring out every strategy that we're trying to figure out how best to address what's going on with um, what what uh, that side of the of the mindset is calling anti wokeness. They want people to stay asleep and not be awakened to the facts of things like racism. Um, gender equality, uh, genders, uh, queer theory, things like that. Um, and they're calling uh, anything, for example, that touches on um, transgender people or uh, gay people or lesbians or any queer people as pornography, even if it's not a, anything that's at all sexually explicit. Um, and so, well, that's sort of what you said. As far as the answer, all of these things are trying to chip away at that. And that's why I said, run for school board, run for, watch when you vote. Um, one of the things in, in, uh, in the primary that I voted in in Maryland the last time, uh, for these tiny little races, I do a whole lot, uh, especially the nonpartisan races, because then I don't have any way to go by maybe they follow a partisan platform but even the partisan races I like to make sure they're following the parts of the platform that I agree with um, but I like to compare them all and it takes a long time if I don't already know the person and I noticed there were a couple of people running for school board non nonpartisan race uh, who were in that camp clearly by their answers and so not only did I vote for other people, but I posted as much as I could and told my friends who lived in the, those, you know, in that area, hey, be careful, make sure you vote in the school board. And these two look really extreme. You know, I mean, that kind of thing, because even, even in the areas where they're getting away with it for now, uh, hopefully others will take them on and hopefully someday win. <laughs> or in the courts. We yeah. have time for one more question, Fred. Uh, yes, hi. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. Uh, my question has to do with 
uh, religious groups. Uh, are you aware of any internal activities within various religious uh, groups to prevent their being hijacked by the more extreme uh, anti-separation groups? I know um, the the uh, uh, the Baptist uh, uh, committee coalition that has been working with uh, us on uh, on separation issues is is one kind of thing. Are there other areas within different different religious groups doing similar kind of work to protect themselves from being hijacked? I'm I'm not aware of of that going on historically. I'm guessing, although I'm not an expert on this that more often those become splinter groups or different parts of the same religion. For example, there are pro-separation of church and state Baptists, and there are some Baptists that want to infringe on others' rights, although historically Baptists have been extremely church-state separationists. Um, the, the whole phrase came up in the letter to the Baptists, um, that wall but uh, I'm not familiar with um, maybe in bylaws or anything, if there's any way to stop. Uh, I mean, and you vote for your own leaders too. So maybe be involved in the national uh, um, organization for your religion, whatever that, if you were an AEU, maybe those folks are trying to be activists at the national level for their congregations. And you can also check the United Methodist Church just went through a major split. Uh, several thousand United Methodist Church left to create something called the Global mm -hmm. Methodist Church because of around LGBTQ issues. And that's all over the news if you're in the, that kind of religious camp and paying attention to mm -hmm. things like that, like I am. That's, for many of us, is not a good sign that one of the largest religious groups in the United States is now dividing into camps. So it's not a good sign. So, Thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you. Really appreciate it. We, we have a, a, an extra special presentation real quick. Uh, that's towards the end. Uh, and so I want to call up one person real quick, if you'd like to come up. Thank you so much. Oh, what, what manner of wizardry is this? My voice does appear much larger than it truly is. I will sing thee a song with this sorcery and hope that you will enjoy it <clears throat> since first. Since first I saw your face, I'd resolved to honor and renown you. If now I be disdained, I wish my heart had never known you. What I that loved and you that liked, shall we begin to wrangle? No, 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 my heart is fast and cannot disentangle. The sun whose beams most glorious are, rejecteth no beholder, and your dear beauty past compare made my poor eyes the bolder. What beauty moves and wit delights and signs of kindness bind me. There, oh there, where'er I go, I leave my heart behind me. If I desire or praise you too much, that fault you must forgive me. And if my hands had strayed but a touch, then falsely must you cleave me. I ask you leave, you bade me love. Is now the time to chide me? No, 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 I love you still. What fortune had betide me? Prithee, prithee, join us at the skills auction. Hey, it will be a wonderful affair with a Shakespearean tone, I might add. I believe it starts at five of the 30 of clock of the clock, yay? 
Yay, please join us, Gramercy. Thank you. That was a nice way to remind you all to get in your skills auction mode and start donating items for that. And please show up on that data bid. I want to welcome Ed from the membership committee. You'd like to say something quickly to us? Yes, thanks, Kurt. It's uh, my pleasure on behalf of the membership committee to add my thanks to our speaker today, but also to thank all of you for attending either in person or on Zoom and to let you know that uh, if you're new to us, there's a lot more to us, as you got a hint here from our serious side and our fun side. And uh, so please come back and uh, uh, join us on other Sunday mornings. And if you're particularly curious, talk to the people in the room if you're there or contact us through our, uh, through our uh, website or email our administrative director. Um, we'd love to get to know you better, and uh, we're a fun group to get to know. So thanks again for coming. Thank you. And just a reminder that uh, community is also one who celebrates and memorizes uh, uh, calls to memorial those who are no longer with us. We're going to be having our Remembrance Sunday uh, Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we have our memorial walk as you come into the door. Uh, if you'd like to contribute something for that paver, uh, please do so. The deadline is May 15th. We had to actually have the bricks engraved. And so we hope that you will do that as well. Kurt, um, I see that Lucy has her hand raised. It may be Lucy, go ahead. about to say the <laughs> same thing, but go ahead, Lucy. Hi, yes, um, about to say the same thing that Kurt just said. It's not, um, May 15th is not the deadline for March getting your uh, checks and inscription form in though. It is March 15, which is just two days away. At least one person has told me his check will be on the way um, and inscription form by tomorrow. And would I please wait an extra day or two? So I certainly will wait an extra day or two for anyone who lets me know, please let me know um, that I should be waiting. We need the time to get our payment in, pay the company, have the bricks inscribed, um, wait for them to come back to us, do the proofreading. And then of course, for Kurt to do the installation so we, we do need a window of time there. But if someone lets me know um, that he or knows he or she or knows knows someone um, who is planning on getting the form and the money in, just let me know and I will wait an extra couple of days for it to get here. Thanks. Thank, thank you for that correction. I apologize. And of course I am your brick mason, so get your orders in now. Uh, next week. We do have Latinas in the laboratory. We'll be celebrating women in science and bringing in young women who have uh, bypassed all the cultural barriers and social barriers to follow something that they love. Uh, and we'll also be recognizing the women of this society, which are 21 of you who are in the field of science. So uh, please plan on joining us next week. Uh, we're gonna be passing the basket. If you'd like to, to donate to this society, we definitely appreciate that. Uh, programs like this take funding and we love your support. Uh, you can also criticize us. You write that on the back of a hundred dollar bill and put it in the basket and I will make sure I read it if you have any other additional comments. And one final thing, Lisa is organizing our community weekend. That's where we, yay, we all go off to Stony Point and have time and camp together and fun uh, camp and nice accommodations. But uh, we need to know if you want to come or not to see if because of the pandemic, we have enough interest. So please see Lisa right away within the next two weeks. She has to get the numbers in a week before that. Uh, and uh, I hope you have a few moments afterwards to stay and let's allow Lori to get some coffee after sitting here talking or drinking. And then before you throw all your questions uh, to, to her, I deeply appreciate that. And now we're going to bring up, yes. There you go. Very Southern thing. You have instant coffee and you will like it. So there we go. And now we have our final piece of music and then our closing words. I'll turn it over to Ron. That last song, last song by Sylvie was a little hard to sing along with. Yes. But we still expect you to sing along with this one. This is Woody Guthrie's um, response to uh, Kate Smith's God Bless America. He got tired of hearing God Bless America over and over again. <laughs> 
So he wrote this song to remind everybody that this land was made for all of us, not just religious or non religious, but for all of us in equal way. <laughs> This land is your land. This land is my land. From the Each favorite verse, as I was walking, I saw a sign there. And Looking around the room, I realized so many of you, am I on? Yeah. So many of you were singing that song, and it reminded me of a time when Americans could all join in songs like that. Uh, and I think that's our ultimate goal. The ultimate goal of the speaker series, series of course, is not to react with hatred, but to kind of understand and even express compassion. When others try to exclude us, our response is not to create systems that exclude others, to find a greater social uh, society where we are all welcome. Uh, the poet Edward Markham, who wrote the famous play, a poem about Abraham Lincoln um, and on the building of the Lincoln Memorial, uh, had one of his shorter little poems called Outwitted. He drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, a rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. 
With that, have a lovely Sunday, and thank you for coming. Thank you. The uh, meeting house will drop off from the Zoom uh, so they can continue with their social hour. And those of us who remain on Zoom, 